Hi people, so first say thank you for those who turned up to today's live stream. If you missed it, not to worry, I do these periodically. They're never on the same day or the same time, it's just sporadic. Um, I just try to do them occasionally to engage with my subscribers. So for uh, those guys who turned up to, to the live stream earlier, thank you. Um, and what I'm going to talk about actually was brought up in that live stream. Um, you know, there is not a day goes by when Donald Trump doesn't come out with something um, controversial. And in one of his rallies, uh, he has basically told his supporters that, um, you know, if they don't pay up, uh, then Russia could do whatever the hell it likes. Uh, I mean, that's, he's talking about uh, this argument that NATO countries, there's unequal distribution of what's put in. Um, basically, he's arguing America pays more than its share. Um, well, we need to look at this claim. I'll, I'll look at that in a second, whether it actually stacks up or not. But um, even if it were true, even if it were true, for a potential president of the United States, for a former president of the United States to basically give Russia a green light to do as it pleases, that could do what the hell it likes. You know, a lot of American presidents have come out with on statesmen like comments over the years. Um, Reagan wasn't always that diplomatic um, when he spoke, for example, about the evil Soviet empire. But that was in the context of the Korean airline shot down in 1983. Uh, Bush was famously prone to gaffes. Um, but I, I cannot think of any president in modern times who has been so isolationist, so prone to these sort of anti-West diatribes, I mean, this is repulsive because it's, I think it's actually the treacherous on the grounds that the United States is one of the founding members of NATO. Donald Trump is publicly denigrating NATO, publicly. Now, where there are differences, that should be behind doors in order not to embolden NATO's enemies, adversaries like Russia and China, um, particularly Russia. So th this sort of thing just plays straight into Putin's hands. Um, and that's why it's so contemptible. And it shows Donald Trump's utter, complete lack of statesmanship. I mean, I recall the day of the Ukraine invasion, the 24th of February 2022, when he said it was a genius move by Putin. A genius move. Now, Trump and his apologists will say, well, that was having a go at Joe Biden rather than being against the Ukrainians. But what sort of message does that send out to people whose country has just been invaded? I think the big thing with Donald Trump is American leadership will really, um, basically, America is going to turn away from the world if Donald Trump gets back in. So uh, let's just look at these claims about European contribution to Ukraine. Um, now the source is Euronote News. I'm going to put a link to this. And you might say it's biased, but this is the figures they're presenting. And this is uh, from last year. It's from um, July last year. So that's just for context. Uh, but they asked the question. Uh, I'll just read it out. It's not too long. Speaking to the French radio station France Inter, EU Commissioner for Internal Market Thierry Breton said the European institutions and EU countries have participated in the Ukrainian war effort as much as the United States. The total contribution to Ukraine since the start of this war is about 72 billion euros. Europe has given roughly the same as the US, he explains. The radio host interjects, claiming that Americans give more than us Europeans, to which Breton insists that both amounts of contributions are roughly equal. To check if that's true, Euronews turned to the Kiel Institute, a German economic think tank. Since the start of the war, their two member analysts have been tracking all the contributions sent to Ukraine through a tool called the Ukraine Support Tracker. According to their research, between February 2022 and May 2023, so the first year of the war, the US pledged nearly 71 billion euros out of total aid to Ukraine. That's the translation. And that's pledged, not the same as delivered. EU countries and institutions have committed to 68 billion euros in total, nearly the same as Washington. So it's a little bit under, but it's roughly the same. Um, but when it comes to humanitarian aid, the EU actually gives twice as much as the United States. 
7.6 billion euros compared to 3.6 billion euros. On the other hand, the US has provided far more military aid, 43 billion euros to the EU's 28 billion. In terms of financial aid, such as loans and subsidies, the EU has provided Ukraine with 33 billion euros. The US, however, has given less, 24 billion euros in financial aid to Kyiv. So really, this depends on how you break it down. Both the EU and the US have extensively supported Ukraine. Now, the American argument, some would say, is a fair one. Why should the United States on the other side of the Atlantic always have to shoulder responsibility for Europe's problems? Although I'm saying always there in the light of how some Americans would see it. I mean, a, a typical American refrain, and this began before Trump, would be, we saved your, sorry for the expletives, but we saved your asses in World War Two. And, you know, the same arguments made for World War One, albeit on a lesser scale. Well, let's look at that. The United States only entered World War Two because Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Um, the prevailing view of the Republican Congress at the time, and even many Democrats, was isolationist. You know, it's Europe's problem that Europe deal with Hitler. Roosevelt personally wanted to act, um, but he was constantly held up in his efforts to do so. It was only Pearl Harbor that that was t- turning point. Coincidentally enough, or ironically enough, for Russia, it was the same thing. The only reason Russia joined the Allies is because of Operation Barbarossa. Um, So this argument of America coming in and saving Europe, America's foreign policy has almost always been motivated by self-interest. Now, that is not to denigrate the sacrifice of young American soldiers who laid down their lives on the beaches of Normandy or in the uh, Italian campaign or other theatres of conflict in Europe, because they did. Um, you know, that's, you know, not to disrespect their sacrifice, and it's something Europeans must always remember. But the idea that America just comes in and saves other countries is is a misconception. Everything America does has a self-interest at heart, and that's true of most countries, but they should be honest about it. Um I think that, I mean, in Britain, we have to say, you know, uh, we had the war bonds, and the uh, land lease program, Churchill uh, famously was indebted to Roosevelt for that. Um, but again, throughout most of 1940, Britain was the only major Western power standing on its own. Britain and the empire. I mean, France had fallen. Um, Poland had been invaded. Um, the Benelux countries had fallen. Britain was the only, Spain was neutral, Britain was the only major Western country standing on its own. And, you know, there were resistance movements, but I'm talking about nation states, resistance movements. So this narrative that Trump is spinning is typical um, kind of American isolationism. Uh, But we often hear about American exceptionalism. Well, if Donald Trump gets back into power, I honestly think America will lose its claim to be the moral leader of the free world. I'm not saying that any other country would fill that vacuum because economically, you know, France, Britain, Germany are far behind the United States economically and militarily. Um, So it's not necessarily that another country would fill that void. But I honestly think if Trump gets back in, denigrating as he does, NATO particularly, it also, as Biden and NATO have pointed out, that it actually endangers NATO troops, American NATO troops. If I was a serving um, American soldier and I was stationed in the Baltic states, I would be disgusted by these comments because Trump may think it's having a go at the EU, but all it's doing is weakening this all round. And it's, um, at least in the eyes of Putin, it's playing straight into Putin's hands. And it's not the first time Trump has done that. I recall as president, he stood beside the Russian tyrant and he denigrated American media because Donald Trump, doesn't know diplomacy. This is a man who is devoid of statesmanship. You know, he will stand there and denigrate the American media because he has a problem with them without factoring in. This is going to play into the hands of the Russian narrative of, you know, what RT would say about the American media. Um, So Trump has no problem pandering to that. And you know what's ironic about all of this? If you had a left-leaning American president, let's say for the sake of argument, Bernie Sanders was president, And he was, you know, playing up to Russian state media and the Russian tyrant. He would be crucified, metaphorically speaking. He would be called a communist. He would be called a traitor. He would absolutely be crucified. 
Um, but when uh, right-wing populist in the form of Trump does, it somehow it gets a free pass. Now, I, I've spoken about this before. I think the reason that a shocking number of MAGA Republicans seem to be okay with Putin, or at least at best they're apathetic to him, is because they seem to think he's kind of a conservative domestically. He's anti-woke. Yellow. I don't know what the Russian word for that would be. But certainly, if you look at the propaganda RT's put out over the years, they've always exploited Western differences. They've always, you know, stoked up the culture wars. And I think there are Republicans, um, more Republicans than British Conservatives, who pandered to this. Um, but, you know, if these people think that Putin is the answer to take on woke intolerance, they're deluded. Putin's sole interest is Russia. Putin's sole interest is undermining the West. Um, he lied to Tucker Carlson. Um, one of my subscribers asked if I saw the Carlson interview. I think it was you, Alon. Um, I've seen snippets of it. Uh, the only ground I will give Carlson is that he did raise the issue of the young American journalist who's currently held on trumped-up charges in Russia. Um, but he failed to ask any questions about Russian journalists. He failed to ask any question about the lack of free speech in Russia. He failed to ask any questions about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I think he asked, you know, would Russia attack Poland? Putin obscenely claimed, you know, he would never do that, only if Poland attacked Russia first. Well, that's a lie from the Russian tyrant, because a week before the war in Ukraine, he was claiming it was a special military operation. Um, it was a lie. It was an invasion. Um, so I, I, I really, I really don't know what's happening over in the United States right now because a country of 340 million people, what is the choice? You have an 81 year old president who unfortunately is showing his age and may well have dementia. That's risky for someone in that position of power versus Donald Trump. Need I say more? It's an awful choice. I mean, if Biden were younger, I'd go with him without question. Even though I abhor woke thinking, even though I abhor the regressive left, I think Biden personally is not that far left. I think he's quite centrist personally. I don't think Biden's particularly far left. He has pandered to the far left. Trump, on the other hand, is an isolationist. Uh, I think he's a nationalist and I think he has pandered unquestionably not just pandered, I think he's ideologically sympathetic to far-right elements in America. I think he's ideologically sympathetic to insurrectionists, people who have the same mindset as Timothy McVeigh in the 90s. You know, Timothy McVeigh and others carried out the Oklahoma City bombing because they were convinced about the deep state. Well, if you look at Trump's power base, not all of them, but a, a worrying number of them have that sort of mindset. And then you factor in the likes of the Oath Keepers and all the other various militia groups, whatever they call themselves, dangerous characters. I, I would say they're domestic terrorists. Trump is pitching to them. That's a disgrace. And of course, after the fact, he'll condemn violence after stoking it up. Um, I don't think Trump is a statesman. I think he, everything he does is self-interested. Um, it's, it's depressing. My hope for the American election is that both parties will replace their presumptive nominees and go for younger, more capable candidates. But I, I don't see it happening at this point. And legally, there's a lot of hurdles to overcome, apparently, for both parties to do that. In the case of the Republican Party, I think they are the swamp right now. I think all the moderates have been pushed out. And in the case of the Democrats, I think the moderates are reluctant to speak up because they worry it would undermine the president. But there may come a point where they have to take that decision. It is brave standing up against the sitting president. And I will say this about Biden. I think he's being selfish, quite frankly, by running again. He must know himself he's got a problem. The first lady must know. I think maybe this will come down to Jill Biden saying something to her husband. And saying, look, you've done, you've got to the top. You've done a term as American president. You've got there. So be happy with that. I, I don't think he should be running again. And as I understand it in the Constitution, a candidate has to be mentally and physically capable to run for president. There's been previous examples. Woodrow Wilson suffered a severe stroke, I believe, in 1918. And for the last two years of his administration, or one and a half years, 
Edith Wilson, the first lady, basically took over executive powers. She was effectively the first woman president in everything but name. Um, could it be that Dr. Jill Biden takes over some of Joe's executive powers? That would be controversial because she's not elected. Um, I, I'm just thinking out loud here. I mean, she's she's significantly younger and she doesn't seem to have those cognitive problems that the president does. I mean, I, I feel it, it's almost a bit like it feels in bad taste talking about this because it's a man's health after all. But he has access to nuclear codes, you know, and every decision he makes matters. He'll have advisors around him. And Biden's White House isn't as toxic as Trump's White House, where you have such a turnaround of advisors and and cabinet members. But, you know, I think all American presidents have a degree of stubbornness, comes with the power. And I just hope Biden listens to people. It may well be for his own sake he needs to step down.